All right, hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is our next lecture here in Unit 7. Now, as a reminder, we've finished up World War I. In our last lecture, we saw the U.S. entrance into the war. We saw the uh, eventual ending of the war as well. And then we got all the way down to the Paris Peace Conference, the Treaty of Versailles. We talked about the League of Nations, and we talked about the mandate system as well. So if you haven't seen that video yet, make sure you go and watch that first because if you haven't watched that and you don't understand what's going on, then this video is not going to make much sense at all. Today, what we're going to see is the rise of totalitarian states. Now, I mentioned this um, earlier in one of the previous lectures that some historians consider World War I and World War II to be the same war, just with a 20-year split or a 20-year um, interim in the middle of it. And that's kind of how we can see it today. What we're going to see is the rise of totalitarian states, but we know that those totalitarian states come out of the failures of the Paris Peace Conference and the Treaty of Versailles. What we have here, what we have pictured here should be fairly obvious here. We have the, the Nazi symbol here. And here is the man uh, who everyone is looking at. This right here is Adolf Hitler. So we're going to figure out today, how do people like Adolf Hitler and other fascist leaders like Benito Mussolini get into power? Let's go ahead and get to our essential questions of the day. To keep the video short, let's go ahead and just jump down to question number four. How did the failure of the Paris Peace Conference Conference and the Treaty of Versailles lead to World War II. That's what we're going to be looking at today, and that's what we'll be looking at in our next lesson as well. We should be able to define totalitarian. So it's a lot of syllables in that word, but we should be able to figure out what it means um, and, and exactly how it relates to World War II. We want to be able to show causation between the Paris Peace Conference uh, the end of the First World War, the Great Depression, and how all of those caused extremist ideologies like fascism and communism. And then we want to be able to compare those ideologies as well. Let's go ahead and get right into the lecture. So historical developments after World War I. We've already talked about women. We know that uh, men came back from the war and many women went back into the domestic sphere, working in the home, raising the children. But we still see that women being a productive member of society in a way is it starts to become more normal. Um, so women in the workplace becomes more normal and women start to gain more rights, specifically the right to vote. So we see many major countries like Germany, Great Britain, even in Turkey and the United States, women gain the right to vote. We also see that the U.S. economy is boosted due to immigration and industrialization. That's a continuity going back to um, Unit 5 and Unit 6, in which the United States received an influx of, of immigrants. And we talked about that. But one thing I do want to talk about is this mass consumerism. And we briefly mentioned it all the way back in Unit 5, but it's worth mentioning again. We see things like this. Here, here we have, uh, have the typewriter. We see something like this, $3 down and it's yours. We call it layaway, but back in the day, they called it the installment plan. You didn't actually have to buy the typewriter or the radio or the refrigerator or your car outright. You could pay it off in installments. And during the age of industrialization, where people had more people had more access to more money, they wanted to engage in this mass consumerism in which they would buy goods for their homes, especially as the middle class is growing bigger and bigger. So we have the rise of the installment plan in which people are almost more or less going into debt in order to buy things like typewriters and radios and refrigerators. Um, but we also see that the stock market has been going up and up and up and up. And so more and more people are putting their money in the stock market. After all, if it keeps going up, it makes sense to put your money in there. You don't want to lose out on that opportunity to take what money you have and make it even larger. All of that leads to this, the Great Depression. Now, I do have a story about the Great Depression. Um, I have had the opportunity to work in various jobs here in Las Vegas, um, but I had a one job in particular as an usher for the Las Vegas 51s back when they used to play um, in North Las Vegas. Now they're out in Summerlin and they're called the Aviators. I don't work out there anymore, but I, I used to work at the ballpark right across the street from Rancho High School. And I met a person named Valeria Green, who was 94 years old when I met her. 
Yes, I believe that's right. We believe she was either 93 or 94. And she was born prior to the Great Depression. I believe if my math is right, she was born in 1924. So during the Calvin Coolidge years, for those of you who are fans of U.S. presidents, she distinctly remembers growing up in Iowa and her father having this prized cattle, this prized cow that he sold to another farmer for $10,000. The thinking at the time was, you need to take that $10,000 and put it in the stock market. After all, you want to grow your money. You want to make it bigger. And he did just that. Well, the day he did that was October 28th, 1929. And the very next day was Black Tuesday. That stock market crash came down and her family lost everything. We'll talk about her more when we talk about World War II, and you'll actually be able to see a picture of her then. But the Great Depression begins October 29th, 1929. What are the causes of it? There's overproduction of farm products, so there's a stock market crash. Look, what we need to know is that the world is in a depression. This doesn't just affect the United States, but it affects all of Europe. So we see that the British are um, about 25% will be unemployed. Germany, we're going to talk about a lot in just a second here. Many Germans were unemployed um, as well. What is the government response? Well, the government response was take a more active role. We need to keep a couple things in mind here for the context. One, we've talked about laissez-faire economics. And laissez-faire economics, as we said, with hands-off approach, let businesses do what they want. But when businesses do what they want, people are susceptible to the highest highs and the lowest lows. So when business is good, especially in the United States, it's kind of based on railroads, but you'll talk about that more next year. When business is good, the stock market is way up, the economy is way up, every single person is doing really well. But if those businesses do bad, the lows are really, really low. Everyone is poor. Everyone's doing, doing horribly. The second thing we want to keep in mind is that during World War I, the governments all across the world took a more hands-on approach, even in Western societies that were more used to laissez-faire um, type, uh, type of system. And so it, what they saw with that is, hey, we can kind of control the businesses and economy at least a little bit, and we can make things good for people. We can make it so our economy never goes like a roller coaster, it goes up and down like this, but just kind of very, very, very gradually goes up. And so governments all across the world will take a more active role. It's the only difference that we're going to talk about today is how active of a role does that government take? Our first example of a very active government comes under President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now he was using uh, Keynesian economics uh, from John Maynard Keynes. This is almost the opposite of laissez-faire. It, what it states is that instead of having this hands-off approach and let like businesses take the economy and go for that roller coaster ride, let's have the government step on in and use deficit spending. What that means is we're going to go into debt, the government will, um, and they'll get loans and whatnot, and they'll put money into the economy in order to stimulate it and grow it. If all of this stuff is very interesting to you, then during your senior year, make sure you sign up for AP Economics with Mr. Seekerman or whoever's teaching it at that time, because they will go into all the details all about this. Uh, this, And it is a, a very interesting part of history. If it doesn't interest you, that's OK. You're you know, there's. <laughs> Not a lot of people who are interested in uh, Keynesian economics and whatnot. So that's fine as well. Just know that the government is taking a more active role. What does Franklin Delano Roosevelt do? Well, he doesn't necessarily control or con uh, constrain businesses, but the government is going to be much more involved and spend a lot more money in order to put people back to work. So instead of being an employee of a business, now you're the employee of a government um, system or, or, or a government spending program. These things included like social security benefits, benefits for people, um, so welfare programs, and then jobs pro programs as well, like the Tennessee Valley Association. You'll talk about all of that more next year when you have AP US history. We also see, <clears throat> If we're jumping to a more extreme here, is we see more totalitarian states. What do I mean by totalitarian or totalitarianism? Totalitarian, totalitarian is fairly easy to remember because all you have to remember is the first part here, total. The state has total control over everything. What is everything? The economy, the government, the culture, society, 
all the ev your every waking moment is somehow controlled by the government that is totalitarian if you remember that you at least got the basics down what does that actually look like well first off you have a single party dictatorship so yes there may be multiple people in fact there probably are multiple people running the government but it's all they're all in the same group here number two is you have state control of the economy there's no laws out there there's no real private businesses the state, the government is going to control all of it. Three, you have police, um, usually secret police um, that spy on uh, the people of that society in order to ensure that they are following the rules and doing what they're supposed to be doing and not saying anything bad about the government. Number four, the government controls all the media. Number five, they control all the schools uh, and the education and they censor any artists who are against them. Let's go back and review what we already know about one totalitarian state, and that's the USSR under Joseph Stalin. Hopefully we remember that Stalin's Soviet Union was this totalitarian state in which he controlled everything. First off, he's more or less the dictator. He controls the Politburo, which is the only party. So you really only have one choice uh, in, into who your leaders are going to be. He took that five-year plan using collectivization, and we saw how the government controlled all that, took land from the landowners and tried to take a, a more collectivized approach, and we saw the failures of that as well. The NKVD were the secret police. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also see that the government is going to engage in Rus Russification in order to indoctrinate its citizens. He controlled the education, setting forth very, very strong discipline, um, and then also sent any political enemies to gulags, uh, which were more or less concentration camps in the middle of Siberia. So we see that Stalin is very totalitarian. Um, and if we if we remember our five year plans, we remember that yes, there were massive amounts of industrialization uh, because of this government control, but there was also massive amounts of starvation due to this government control. So now we've set up the basis of the government being more involved. We've seen a more moderate example with Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his New Deal plans. We've seen the more extreme example with communism under Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union. What we're going to see is a new different type of totalitarian state that we haven't gone over yet, and that's fascism. We need to go over fascism in two countries, Italy and Germany. And before we do so, we want to remember back to our previous lesson. We talked about the Treaty of Versailles and the Paris Peace Conference. We saw that Italy did not get the lands that they were promised in the um, Treaty of London. We also saw with Germany that Germany lost out on some of their land in Alsace-Lorraine. Keep those things in mind as we're moving forward in our study. So this is the rise of fascism in Italy, and this is a name that we should know. Uh, this is Benito Mussolini. Let's talk about him. First, let's look at fascism. Fascism is a centralized authoritarian government that glorifies the state over the individual. It's the exact opposite of the United States. The United States glorifies the individual. You get to do whatever it is that you want. You are the individual. You are the one who's important. Fascism says, the individual is not important unless they are um, with the state, unless they see themselves as working for the state. And we'll see a quote from Benito Mussolini in just a little bit that really exemplifies that. There's an extreme amount of nationalism that glorifies violence, discipline, and most importantly, loyalty to the state. Do not act out on your individual desires. You want to go work some job, uh, you, you know, get a college degree, do something like that, that none of that matters. What you're supposed to do is whatever the state tells you to do. And we'll see examples in just a second. Let's look at this quote here. So this is a direct quote from Benito Mussolini about the doctrine of fascism, trying to convince people that fascism is a really, really good thing. Anti-individualistic, the fascist conception of life stresses the importance of the state, okay, key part there, and accepts the individual only insofar as his interests coincide with that of the state, which almost seems oxymoronic. So, yeah, we accept the individual as long as they don't think individually and only think about the state. So you more or less don't accept the individual. But that's the idea there. That is the, the key part of fascism, everything for the state. We also see here that we have our two different totalitarian ideas. We have communism and fascism, and yet they are, weirdly enough, 
opposites of one another and enemies of one another. So this is, it, it does get a bit strange, but allow me to explain everything. So with communism, yes, we see that under um, uh, Joseph Stalin in the USSR, it's totalitarian, but ultimately they do want international change. They don't just want one country to be communist. They want the entire world to become communist. That was a, a very Trotsky uh, way of thinking about things. And we briefly, briefly talked about him, uh, but you'll study him hopefully hopefully some, po some point later. Um, we're not going to talk about him right now. Ideally, there would be absolutely no social classes. And we talked about that under Marxism uh, and, and Karl Marx's ideas in the Communist Manifesto. That's how it's supposed to work ideally. And yet it never actually works in that way because of human corruption and greed and all of those things. And the third is no private property. We saw that with collectivization under um, Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union. But then we see over here with fascism, yes, it's still a totalitarian state, but first off, they are sworn enemies of the communists. Why are they? Well, fascism is more concerned about nationalist goals. They're not trying to make international change. They're just trying to protect their own nation. They also have social classes. While communism had no social classes, fascism says, yeah, there's going to be rich people, there's going to be poor people, and that's the way it is. That's totally okay. And therefore, private property is completely allowed. The other part here is kind of a religious component. Fascism, very much religion was allowed and, and encouraged as well. Benito Mussolini uh, used a lot of Catholicism in his, in, in his speeches. In communism, you don't have that. In fact, most communists... At least they're promoting atheism, it, it, the leaders of communism, because the idea is that they are the ones in charge, not any sort of deity or other religious power. So power. So we can remember communists promote atheism, fascists, uh, fascists don't. Uh, fascists promote um, some sort of religion there. However, there are some similarities that we need to be very much aware of. One, blind loyalty to a charismatic leader whether that's mussolini hitler stalin doesn't matter they're a leader they use propaganda we'll see that in just a moment as well and they demand loyalty to them two they use terror stalin sends people to gulags hitler shoots people in the street they use terror in order to get the people to stay in line and number three they flourish during hard economic times this is the great depression this, it's hard on people. People are worried not about like day-to-day -day things, but they're worried about their survival because they don't have access to money, they don't have access to a job, and therefore don't have access to food. So they are willing to do radical things in order to survive. That includes supporting totalitarian states. Like neither of these states would ever come about in normal circumstances. Like communism would never come about if Russia weren't so backwards. Fascism wouldn't have come out if Italy and Germany had at least gotten part of what they want wanted in the Treaty of Versailles. It's only when it's very, very difficult economic times do these extremist ideologies come forward and are promoted. Do keep that in mind here, especially given the fact that I made all those comparisons between 1919 and the year 2020 the other day in class, or sorry, in the other day in the lecture. Do keep that in mind for our own life as well. Let's go ahead and move on. Fascism in Italy. So I've already talked about Benito Mussolini. He's the first European fascist. He eventually becomes dictator in 1925. He uses all the same methods for control. So we talked about totalitarian states and how the state is the center of everything and they use secret police and they use propaganda and they control all the education yet benito mussolini does all of those things his nickname is el duce which means the leader okay so that's what he calls himself he's got a little, little nickname for himself why does this all this occur why does fascism rise well they don't receive the lands that they were promised in the treaty of the treaty of london during world war one there's high unemployment due to the great depression there's extreme class differences as well the rich are super super rich the poor are super super poor and there's people who have been inspired by the russian revolution there's a couple different things that are going on here one, there's a rise in communism in Italy, and people are looking at that and going, oh, no, that's not good. We need someone to stop this communist revival in Italy or this communist rise in Italy. And Benito Mussolini says, hey, just give me all the power and I'll totally stop those nutjob communists. And so people are like, here you go, Benito Mussolini. Please have all the power. Please stop these nutjobs from taking over. Um, but we also see that 
if Russia can engage in a revolution and completely change their society, why can't Italy do the same thing? We also see that Italy has these imperialist ambitions, just as they did uh, prior to World War One. They want to play with the big boys. They want to play with the, those who are the, the British, the French, all those other very strong societies. And so finally, they're able to take over Ethiopia in 1935, define the League of Nations. And this is important part here because we'll see Japan do something similar in our next lesson. Why is it that Benito Mussolini is willing to defy the League of Nations? Part of it is that he wants Ethiopia and wants to expand, but the other part of it is that he doesn't get anything from the League of Nations. The League of Nations hasn't prevented his country from uh, suffering the effects of the Great Depression. It didn't give him the land uh, along the Dalmatian coast from the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. So why would I stay in the League of Nations? Like, what, what punishment can the League of Nations give me? They haven't given me anything at all, so they can't take anything away. So he leaves the League of Nations. Do keep that in mind, especially when we talk about the successor to the League of Nations, which is today's United Nations. Women in fascist Italy, think about it this way. Men in fascist Italy were supposed to work in the factories. Women were supposed to be the factory, specifically be the children factory. Stay at home, make children, because you're not supposed to make individual decisions. You're supposed to do things for the state. So we are talking about very, very large Italian families. You were given tax breaks and awards if you had more than 14 children who could be then taken and if they're boys put into the army and if they're women, make more babies. Um, so we, we see that, yes, everything is for the state. And I think this is the most egregious example of that. Um, we see here that they very much glorify the military. I mean, look at all these guys standing with their guns. Look at Benito Mussolini in his military uniform. This is not a guy who's like in their in like American democratic society in which he's like going around waving at people, giving big speeches, kissing babies, doing all that stuff. No, this is a strict, disciplined military leader who's going to make Italy great once more. So. That's the ideas under fascism. We also see the artifacts of fascist states here. So we have two that I want to talk about. The first one are the young fascists. And Hitler will do something similar with the um, education um, of uh, young Germans. So we see that boys from a very young age are trained to be soldiers, to know the discipline, to be able to fight and serve for their country. We also see the propaganda. One for all, all for the douce all for this guy right here. Everyone needs to serve him in order to make um, this state powerful. We talked about this very briefly, but Mussolini invents, it ends up invading Ethiopia. Think back, this is a continuation, a continuity of what we've already talked about before, except the difference is this time he is successful. Now we need to get to um, obviously the most infamous individual in almost all of world history, and that's Adolf Hitler. But you'll notice something. Is all these people, even though we know that this is the most evil man in the world, are smiling and they're happy and they, they want to meet him. Why? What makes them happy? Why do they love Adolf Hitler? And that's what we're going to talk about right here. Germany was weak. We talked about the United States being weak. We talked about Italy being weak. We even talked about Great Britain being weak. Germany is a whole different type of weak. First off, they lose land, Alsace-Lorraine, the Ruhr Valley, the Rhineland, all of that land, all of those resources are lost. Number two, they have to pay $33 billion in reparations. Pretty much what the, what the Allied powers did is say, hey, this war cost $33 billion, Germany, you're going to pay for all of it. So they are massively in debt. So instead of being able to spend money on their people, they have to spend money and on other nations. They have a tiny army because the Treaty of Versailles said, Germany, we don't trust you with a huge army. So your army is not going to be really, really small so we can control you guys. In addition, we have the Great Depression. So people from the United States are no longer buying German exports, not because it's German, but because they don't have money to buy anything. And this leads to high unemployment. And this leads to hyperinflation as we see here. So this, these look like bricks. They look like big Lego bricks, but they're not. They are wads of German marks. Think of it as dollars, pretty much. 
This is how worthless they are. What hyperinflation is, is when you print more and more money. And as you print more and more and more money, the, the actual value of each individual dollar or each individual German mark is worth less than it was before. The Germans are going through this massive amount of hyperinflation, which means if you're a person who saved a bunch of money, it's pretty much worthless at this point. And the reason they're printing so much money is they have to pay for everything. They have to pay $33 billion. So yeah, this looks like a whole lot of money here. I don't know, it's worth like a buck or something. That's really about it. That's how worthless that money is. And whenever you have hyperinflation, you have a very, very bad and weak economy. At this time, we also see a very weak republic. The Weimar Republic had taken over or had really been installed and put into place in order to keep Germany in place. Um, the republic is a weaker form of government. Yes, it's more democratic. Yes, more people get to make decisions, but that means it's very difficult for the Weimar Republic to actually do anything about the problems that it's facing. So pretty much we have this inept government who isn't fixing any of these problems for many of the unemployed individuals in Germany, including, but not limited to, Adolf Hitler. Here's at least a few pictures I could show you guys in order to illustrate everything that I just said as well. So we have Germany here, right? So Germany lost land over here, which is what, what now uh, lost a bit of land to Poland. They lost a bit of land to France with Alsace Lorraine as well. There was a demilitarized zone right here. So Germany shrank. And because it physically shrank, its economy shrank as well. As we see down here with the note, the Treaty of Alsace and Lorraine, uh, sorry, the treaty took Alsace and Lorraine away, reducing German coal production by 40%, so greatly reducing their ability to industrialize. We also have Germany's loss of troops. I'm not going to read off every single number, but look, the French, huge army. The Belgians, huge army. The Czechoslovaks, huge army. The Polish, huge army. Germany, little tiny baby army right there. Okay, so that's where Germany is at this point. They're feeling very, very weak. And there's a massive amount of German unemployment here. Almost, uh, according to this chart, 30%. But in some cases, I believe it did actually get up to 40% as well. So that is the context for this guy right here. Who is Adolf Hitler? Well, he was born actually in Austria in 1889, and he fought during World War I. But in the post-war years, he sees the weak Weimar, Weimar Republic. He sees a very, very weak Germany, a Germany that was embarrassed on the international stage. And so he wants to get rid of the Weimar Republic. He says, let's get rid of this weak government who does absolutely nothing for us. Let's take a strong government who's going to stand up for Germany against its enemies in France and Britain and Czechoslovakia and, and take back those German lands that we had before. And this message would actually resonate very, very well with people because that's exactly what they want. They want Germany returned to its former glory, or if they can't get it to its former glory, at least allow them to survive instead of being bullied by other nations. And so Hitler attempts a government coup and fails to do so and goes to prison. Well, in prison, he writes Mein Kampf, his most famous book. It's uh, translated to My Struggle, um, in which he explains his points of view. And there's a lot in there, but we're going to point out two of them. One, that Aryans, so blonde hair, blue eyed Germans are the master race and the Jews are the enemies. The Jews are the ones who uh, were the reason why Germany lost World War I. And Hitler explains all that in the book there. But um, the important thing for us is that this is another example of anti-Semitism that we've been talking about a lot in this unit. The second idea is Liebenschaft. The, and we, <laughs> Miss Rival would be very upset with my pronunciation of that. But Germany needs to expand to have more living space. Germany lost a lot of land and therefore lost a lot of resources. We as Germans need to expand, need to take back that land and need to get those resources. In order to do so, we can't wait on the Weimar Republic this week and that government. We need a strong leader, someone who is able to be a fascist like Benito Mussolini. So his rise happens very, very quickly. He becomes a major leader in the National Socialist German Workers Party. If you say National Socialist really fast, in German, it sounds like Nazi. So that's where we get the Nazi party from. Um, he, they did well in the 1932 elections. Hitler's appointed chancellor in 33 because he's very popular, becomes president in 34, and eventually controls the whole thing. Um, it, 
by 1935. He's dictator. He's the one in control. And people love him. Let's talk about his propaganda first. So Andrew says this, the function of propaganda does not lie in the scientific training of the individual, but in calling the masses attention to certain facts, processes, necessities, whose significance is thus for the first time placed within their field of vision. So it's not about training people to be better, but just making them aware of certain pieces of information. He goes on, all propaganda must be popular and its intellectual must be adjusted to the most limited intelligence among those it's addressed to. Consequently, the greater the mass is it intended to reach, the lower its purely intellectual will have to be. So propaganda is meant to be dumb. If you're trying to appeal to everyone, dumb it down. Keep it really, really short. Make it really easy to understand. Don't allow for any actual critical thinking or argument. Its aim is to influence a whole people. We must avoid excessive intellectual demands on our public and too much caution cannot be extended in this direction. You don't want the public to think too much. You don't want them to think critically. You just want them to accept things. And Adolf Hitler, for all of his faults, of which there are many, he is amazing at using propaganda. Like he uses propaganda and he is a fascist leader unlike any other fascist leader. He's really, really good at being bad. Let's go ahead and talk about his tactics that he uses. One, he uses this cult of personality. Hitler's an insp a really inspiring speaker to the German people. He knows how to hit the people not only in their brains, but really in their hearts, really appeal to their emotions. And what he does is he always starts really, really low. And he talks to the people and he looks them in the eye. And this is how he begins every single speech. And as the speech goes on, he gets louder and louder and louder and louder until he is yelling and screaming. And all of the people are yelling and screaming and excited with him. So this instills a whole lot of loyalty, but it also instills fear. How does he instill fear? Well, he uses the secret police, the Gestapo and his personal troops, the SS, in order to ensure that everyone is following the rules. And if you step the wrong way, well, you, you're, Hitler's going to take you out, whether you're somehow going to disappear, let's say. You'll either be sent somewhere or you'll be shot. He, has the, um, ed, he controls the education with the Hitler youth, as we see here. I mean, this is a young boy who aspires to be just like Supreme Commander Adolf Hitler. He also has this economic program, and this ultimately is why people love him. He involves the government and does so, so much that he lowers unemployment to zero percent. And so many people in Germany are saying, well, yeah, look, the guy's loud and yeah, he's mean to Jews, but man, I have a job. I have food on my table. I don't have to look at my wife and kids and wonder, you know, are they going to be able to survive and make it? Am I going to be able to provide for them? This guy's ensured that I have a job. So this is better than any alternative is what many people are saying. And then ultimately he defies the treaty. He stops paying. He's going to build up the army. He's going to eventually take back the land as we're going to see in just a second. Now Hitler appeals to nationalism. He recalls the glories of the past by specifically calling his society the Third Reich. What is the, the Third Reich? Well, the First Reich was the Holy Roman Empire, um, which began under Charlemagne in the year 800 and uh, ended after the Napoleon, or sorry, during the Napoleonic Wars in 1806. The second time Germany was very, very powerful was under Otto von Bismarck after 1871 with the Franco-Prussian War. This is going to be the third time that Germany is powerful because of Adolf Hitler, and it's going to last for a thousand years. It lasts for a decade. We also see, as, as we talked about before, the anti-Semitism. So first off, you have the Nuremberg Laws put into place in 1935, which more or less created two separate societies. Jews over here, Germans over here, and Germans were the ones who were going to be powerful. It forbade marriage between Jews and non-Jews. They did not have German citizenship. They could not fly the German flag. They could not hold government jobs. It was more or less legal discrimination. And we'll see a picture in just a second. We also see that not only are there laws, there's violence against the Jews as well in the uh, event of Kristallnacht in 1938, which is the night of broken glass. The Nazis, based on 
uh, I don't know, some some trumped up charges, we'll say, engineered op an operation that destroyed Jewish homes, synagogues, businesses. Ultimately, they rounded up 30,000 Jewish men and arrested them or sent them to camps. So we see this high level of anti-Semitism. And most seen evidently here as these women have to wear a star on their on their dresses in order to point out that they are, in fact, Jewish. Um, so they have to walk around with more or less this identification card that says, yes, you are allowed to legally discriminate me. Um, and so we see we see that occur in Germany. We need to talk about a few other things and then we'll get to the doorstep of World War II. The first one is the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939. So in the 1920s, um, Spain, like every other society, was experiencing the, the Great Depression. Um, and they had been under a dictator for an incredibly long time time. Well, all of that changed with the Spanish Republic, the Popular Front. They won a major election in 1936, and they were going to reform their society. They were going to take down uh, the powers that be. They were going to engage in land reform. All those things that we talked about when we looked at the Ottomans and the Russians and the Qing Dynasty, all of that. But in response, the nationalists, so mainly the Catholic Church and other con very conservative individuals did not want that to occur. So there was a, a coup against the popular front. So you, what you have is very liberal reformers who want to uh, you know, take down the rich and the powers that be and you know, redistribute land to the people versus people who want to maintain the status quo and a more conservative way of life. What we see here is that all of these societies that will eventually be involved in World War II are going to be involved in the Spanish Civil War. It's more or less this proxy war that occurs. Um, and we'll talk about what proxy wars are in Unit 8. Um, but we see that Hitler and Benito Mussolini support the fascist, uh, sorry, support the nationalists. Hitler and uh, Benito Mussolini support a strong centralized government, and that's what they would like to have in Spain. The British, the French, the Soviet Union, and the United States assist the Republicans. They want individualism and independence, and so that's what they support. Um, we also get this painting here. This is a very famous one by Pablo Picasso, and this is Guernica. I probably pronounced that one wrong, but this was a city in northern Spain that was bombed by Germany. So what we're seeing here in the 1930s is we're seeing a precursor of what World War II is going to be like. We've already seen the bombings that we're going to talk about in our next lesson with the Blitz over London. We've seen the sides that people are going to take. We've seen Hitler and Italy on one side and everyone else on the other side. Eventually, the nationalists win and Francisco Franco is going to be installed as dictator and will rule until 1975. The Spanish Civil War was incredibly atrocious as well. Anywhere from about half a mil million to a million people are going to die either due to the actual warfare itself or due to starvation and disease because of the war. So we're starting to see the grotesque nature of the war that's going to occur as well. As I said, it's very much a precursor to World War II. Okay, now we got to talk about Germany very, very quickly here, and that will wrap up today's lesson. Germany needs to build alliances if it's actually ever going to stay in power. It's kind of in this very odd part geographically where it needs friends if it's going to be able to protect itself from big bad Russia over here, or sorry, big bad Soviet Union over here, and France over on this side. So the first one's the Rome-Berlin axis. That one makes the most sense. Italy, you guys are fascists. Germany, we're fascists. Let's get along. The second one is the anti common turn back, in which Germany and Japan joined forces. Now, we're going to talk about Japan and their route to World War II in our next lecture, but both of them are very worried about the Soviet Union. We've seen that Germany and the Soviet Union don't get along because they both want, they're both very wary of one another and think the other one's going to try to take their land. We saw that in World War I, but we also saw the Russo Japanese War in 1904 to 1905. We see that the Italian, I'm sorry, the Japanese and the Russians don't get along. And so the, the Germans and the Japanese bond over their hatred for the Soviet Union. It's not that Germany is really good friends with Japan. It's more of a the enemy of my enemy is my friend type, type of thing. So that's what we have there. And then we also have Liebersham, as I've talked about before, and he's going to take land. So the first one is taking the Rhineland right here, which includes Alsace-Lorraine uh, in 1936, and then he takes over Austria in 1938. What I will need you to remember is see this part right here around Czechoslovakia? That is called the Sudetenland, and we're going to talk about that right here. 
In 1938, Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Britain, signs the Munich Pact with um, Adolf Hitler, which allows him to take former German lands. What uh, Hitler said is, look, this Sudetenland, this area around Czechoslovakia, used to belong to Germany. We'd really like it back. And Neville Chamberlain does not want to engage with Adolf Hitler. This is called appeasement. Now, what we see here is exactly what appeasement is. This appeaser right here is giving the lollipop to all of these big, horrible monsters who clearly have the swastika on them. So he's trying to appease them and say, OK, here's one more lollipop. And then all you guys go home and don't ask for anything ever again. Look, you guys know that's not going to work. I know that's not going to work either. That's like trying to appease like a bratty kid, like a bratty kid goes to a mall. He's like, I want a cookie. He starts banging his feet and then, you know, you know, punching his mom or something. Um, And so his mom like, oh, it's like, OK, I want to I want to keep my kid happy. I don't actually want to discipline him or uh, teach him any you know good morals or values or anything. And so she buys him the cookie and, you know, she thinks, OK, I bought him the cookie. Now my job is done there. I'm, I'm good. And wh what's really happened is you just taught that kid that he can pretty much cry and scream and do whatever he wants and that you're going to provide it for him. That's kind of what Neville Chamberlain is doing here with Adolf Hitler. As long as Hitler cries and screams enough and says the right things, well, Neville Chamberlain is going to go ahead and give him the land that he wants. And it's not going to work out well. Hitler then signs the non-aggression pact with Joseph Stalin, which they agree not to attack one another as long as both of them get Poland. Um, and so obviously the USSR is going to take East Poland um, and Hitler will take um, Western Poland. That happens on September 1st, 1939. Now you might ask, why appeasement? Like it's so obviously wrong, why would you do it? We also see here that Dr. Seuss has no time or patience for appeasers. He goes out of his way to make fun of them often. Why appeasement? First off, people are much more focused on the economy because of the Great Depression. And so Hitler is kind of like this sideshow thing. Like, you know, in the news, they'll say Hitler's taking more and more land. And most people go, eh, dude, I'm trying to get a job and like trying not to, you know, not to starve. So, yeah, that's like not really that important to me. Number two is anti-communism. A lot of people say, look, yeah, I understand Hitler's bad, but I'm really scared about what's going on with this whole communism thing. And if fascists can shut down communism, hey, I'm with the fascists then. And number three is the Treaty of Versailles. A lot of people say, well, look, you guys at the end of World War I made this occur. You treated Germany so harshly that you gave them no other choice. He's justified in what he's doing. And so there is this type of uh, appeasement there. And it's not until Neville Chamberlain leaves office and Winston Churchill comes in, who we'll talk about in our next lesson, that we actually get rid of appeasement and we start to engage and fight with Adolf Hitler. Um, we see this political cartoon here. So this is supposed to represent the non-aggression pact as in, you know, Stalin is marrying uh, Adolf Hitler right here. And the question is, how long will this honeymoon last? And we see that Hitler lies a lot. He said, I'm not going to, you know, invade uh, Czechoslo Czechoslovakia and then does so. Um, you know, I'm not going to invade Poland and then it does so. So, yeah, Hitler lies a lot. And uh, that's uh, it's kind of the way it is. So we can assume moving forward how long that non-aggression pact is going to last. Ladies and gentlemen, I do apologize for the length of that lecture there, but we've gotten through everything that we need to get through. In our next lesson, we'll be going over Japan's route to World War II, and then we'll hopefully actually get into the fighting as well. I'll see you guys then.